Chapter 10 of your text is entitled, God is Three. When you look in Scripture, we have uh, the uh, claim that God is one, but we also have the claim that God is actually made of three persons. This is that mystery of the Trinity, where God is both one and three. We have <clears throat> indications that God uh, is the Father. He's referred to as God the Father. He's also... Uh, referred to as Jesus. Jesus is God the Son. He's equal with the Father according to various uh, passages. He is, God refers to himself as us. Let us make man in our image. So we have multiple indications that there are multiple members of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're going to have some future chapters where we get into a little more detail on the, uh, on the Godhead but right now, we just have to note that there's a multiplicity of members of the Godhead. There is more than one. And again, like the other features of God, the fact that there is more than one person of the Godhead is something we cannot see because God is invisible. Uh, all three members of the Godhead are invisible. So uh, we would not be able to detect his uh, multiplicity uh, unless God wanted us to see it, and he chose to illustrate the multiplicity of the Godhead by putting evidence of it in the creation. And in this particular instance, I believe he created what we call biodiversity, extreme biodiversity, to in fact illustrate the, the multiplicity of the Godhead. And it, in order to create a large biodiversity, and biodiversity refers to uh, a large number of different kinds of organisms, different types of organisms on the planet, in order to uh, sprinkle that many organisms on the top of the planet, I believe that he created a variety of climates. In creating a variety of climates, he put he created different places where he could put uh, a whole suite of organisms in one cli climate. He could put another whole suite of organisms in another climate. The more climates he created, the more organisms he could create, the more he could show biodiversity. So let's look at how God created the earth in such a way as to automatically create a variety of climates. Turns out he, tur he created the earth in a spherical form. The consequence of this, plus the fact that the source of heat for the sun, uh, for the earth, is actually the sun, a point source a long ways away. These two things combine the spherosity of the earth with the, uh, the point source of heat being a long ways away from the earth. The result of this is a variety of climates. And the main reason for this is <clears throat> that sunlight that shines directly onto the middle of the earth from the source of the sun to the earth is, uh, if you imagine just, let's say, a beam of light, kind of imagine a, a flashlight-focused beam of light that lands on the earth. When you shine it directly on the earth so it ends up coming in perpendicularly to the earth, the uh, light will shine in a very well-defined circle. But if you take that same flashlight and move it upwards so that it shines on the pole of the earth, but at this very high angle, that circle of light will get spread over a long distance into a long oval of light. So the same amount of light hitting the equator of the earth is concentrated in a small circle that same amount of light hitting the pole of the earth is spread out over a long oval. The consequence is that the sunlight that hits the equator of the earth heats up the earth much more than the sunlight that hits the pole of the earth. The consequence of that is that the equator of the earth tends to be much warmer than the pole of the earth. The consequence of that is that we have <clears throat> at the uh, equator, what we call the tropical zone of the earth, within 0 and 15 degrees of the uh, equator, we have warm air that is also wet 
it is, uh, it's carrying a bunch of water. In fact, the warmer air is, the more water it can evaporate into it, the more water it can carry. This warm air at the equator evaporates water from off of the ocean and bodies of water, and the air rises from the surface of the earth. So the sun is heating the surface of the earth, it's heating up the air, the air picks up a bunch of water, and because it's warm air, and warm air tends to rise, the warm air carrying its water rises above the tropical zone. As it rises, it in fact cools. Uh, rising air expands as it rises because there's less atmospheric pressure up above, and as it expands, it cools. As it cools, it can no longer carry as much uh, water, and the water falls out as rain. So as the air rises that is carrying the water, it rains a lot in the tropical zone. So the tropical zone of the earth is not only warm because the sun has, is shining upon it and heating up the surface, but the evaporation of water into the air, subsequently dropping out as it rises, creates a lot of rain at the equator. This rising air sort of drives other air out of the way. As it's rising, it's got to push other air out of the way. And it, what it does is the air moves to the north and to the south, away from the equator, and eventually comes back down to the Earth. And the reason it does is because as it goes up, it expands and gets cold. Once it becomes cold, it now wants to sink. For the same reason that warm air rose, cold air sinks, and so somewhere around about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude, the air that rose at the equator comes back down to the earth. But that air that comes back down is, is already lost all of its water. The water was wrung out of the air here as it was rising above the equator. So the air that comes down at 30 degrees north and south latitude is coming down completely dry, basically having no water whatsoever in it. So cold, dry air sinks, creating a desert zone 30 degrees north of the equator and 30 degrees south of the equator. We can see this as uh, we look at the Earth from satellites. Here we have three satellite photos of the Earth, and I've put upon them uh, the lines that correspond to the equator in the middle and the lines of 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south in each case. So here, for example, in Africa, we have the equatorial line running through the middle of Africa, the 30 degrees south line running through South Africa, and the 30 degrees north line running through North Africa. You can tell from the colors in the satellite photos that there's green stuff at the equator it's plants that are growing there because it's well watered. And you've got brown stuff at the 30 degrees north and south latitude. These are desert regions. There aren't so many plants here. So you've got deserts at 30 degrees south, desert at 30 degrees north. That's a Sahara desert, which you're familiar with. Here in North America and South America, the equator goes through, uh, through the middle of uh, the northern part of South America. The 30 degrees south goes through a desert region in Chile and Peru. And the 30 degrees north line goes through the western desert of the United States. Here in Asia, the equatorial line goes through uh, Borneo and Java and places like that. The 30 degrees north line goes through some deserts in western uh, uh, Asia. The 30 degrees south goes right through Australia. Most of Australia is desert because it's sitting at the 30 degrees south position. The air that comes down at 30 degrees north and south uh, splits. Some of the air goes back to the uh, tropics to, in fact, replace the air that's rising at the tropics, creating a cycle of air rising at the tropics, dropping at 30 degrees north, and 30 degrees south latitude, the rest of the air moves along the surface of the Earth and will ultimately get warmed 
as it moves along the surface of the earth, become warm enough to rise again and uh, again come back and replace the air that's sinking at 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south. The air gets to about 60 degrees north latitude and south latitude when it gets warm enough to rise up into the atmosphere. <coughs> the, in, under those circumstances, that air that is warm is able to pick up uh, water, uh, evaporated water in it, and carry it up into the atmosphere. The air rises because it's warm, but again, as it rises, it expands and cools and wrings out its water. Now, it's not as warm as the air was at the tropics, so it doesn't carry as much water as the tropical air does. Uh, so although it rains, because it's wringing out the, the water as, it, as, it, as the air rises, it doesn't rain as much as in the tropics. And it isn't as warm as it is in the tropics. So you have what's called a temperate zone here at 60 degrees north, 60 degrees south latitude which is uh, somewhat warm, but much cooler than the tropical zone, and it's wet. It's actually raining at these, uh, these locations. The air that rises at 60 degrees north, 60 degrees south, will rise up into the atmosphere, part of it returning to 30 degrees uh, north, 30 degrees south, to come back down to the deserts. Another portion, uh, moves to the north in the northern latitudes towards the pole, gets cold enough by the time it gets all the way to the North Pole to sink down to the Earth's surface again. Just like the air that rose from the tropics and came down in the desert zones, this air is so cold and has been wrung out of its, uh, its, its water has been wrung out of it so much that it's coming down as extremely dry air. The poles of the earth are very severe deserts. Uh, in most cases in the poles, it has not precipitated, it has not rained or snowed uh, for many centuries in most of those cases. It's extremely dry desert air, but it is also very cold. So it's not like the desert zone uh, in being not just dry, but also uh, warm. The Poles are extremely cold and dry. That produces what we call the polar zone. So the very fact that God created the earth in a spherical shape with a point source of light some distance away and a heat some distance away creates a variety of climates. A, polar, a, a, a tropical zone at the near the equator, within 15 degrees of the equator, a desert zone at 30 degrees north and south latitude, a temperate zone at 60 degrees north and south latitude, and a polar zone at each of the poles. This variety of climates gives us uh, a, a variety of situations where different organisms can be designed for each of the climatic zones, and that's what we'll look at in the next session.